To talk Citadel football at Big John's Tavern, located at 251 East Bay Street in downtown Charleston, our new location for this season. And this bar just reopened here in the last uh, about six weeks, now owned by three Citadel grads and uh, one of the oldest bars in the history of uh, the downtown Charleston here. Opened way back in the 50s originally. Come check them out, Big John's Tavern. We're here every Wednesday talking Citadel football as the coaches show is brought to you by Cutwater Spirits. And of course, joined by the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson. Coach, good evening, how are you? Luke, I'm doing well. Hey, we got Furman this week. Mm -hmm. uh, had a really good day of practice here at Big John's on Wednesday. And, uh, you know, everything's going uh, according to plan so far. Well, happy to hear. We'll get ready for that Furman game. We'll look back at the game against ETSU. You, you just kind of touched on it, but how has this week gone so far for the team since uh, the game Saturday? Well, Tuesday's practice wasn't, you know, wasn't nearly what we needed, and, and we needed to catch back up, and I told the guys that. Uh, heading out of Tuesday's practice and into Wednesday's practice, uh, I thought we got caught back up a little bit today. Uh, tomorrow will be the final touches on everything, and then, you know, Friday it's, it's, it's over. First true road trip of the year against ETSU. I know going up there, you guys had a little traffic, got there a little bit later. You had the later kick on Saturday. I'm sure you got home late. So just what was the travel like, even the recovery to get back home late Saturday and, you know, pick it back up on Sunday? Yeah, you know, unfortunately we did. You know, heading out 26 anymore, just heading east, or excuse me, heading to the west. If we had east, we're in the Atlantic here. Uh, if we head to the west out there, is it's no telling what you're going to get between here and Columbia. Uh, we got jammed up. Even on the backside of Columbia, we got jammed up over by Clinton. We had a couple of accidents. Uh, it took us about six hours to get there, and it was raining and a little bit miserable in East Tennessee. Um, however, you know, once we got settled in over there, it was, uh, it, you know, it was went as planned. Everything was kind of uh, according to plan there. And then uh, being a 4:30 kick is a little bit of an odd time for us to kick. Now we've had two really different times to kick up there at East Tennessee the last two years: a 3:30 and a 4:30 kick. Now, less than ideal, you know. Anything after. Two o'clock, I say, on the road, especially it's very difficult when you have a five-hour trip back home. Mm -hmm. uh, we got back home at about 1.45 on uh, Monday, or excuse me, Sunday morning right there, and that was uh, a quick turnaround because we don't have any options. We've got to get there. We've got to get back for practice uh, at a well, one, I think I believe we begin about 1 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, so it, it's a quick turnaround for our guys, but they're used to it. It's what we've got to do, uh, and then Monday's our day off. I know, uh, you know, traveling with different teams, I've worked with different coaches that, you know, on the bus, they're watching the game film, they're getting right into it. When you have a long trip like that, what's your process like after a game like that Saturday as you head back home? You know, Tony on the defensive side, he watches it a little bit. Uh, I, I don't. I kind of let myself um, put it away. Uh, I don't have any interest in looking at it right away. I think it's best if I just kind of just let it sit and then move on from there. I have done it before in some of the road trips. Um, I don't like to do it. It, it just kind of, um, there's nothing you can do about that game. You got to worry about it on Sunday. So uh, some guys do it. We don't. Uh, most of our guys go ahead and just, just take a nap. They're exhausted. Yeah, I could certainly understand. Uh, we'll talk more about that ETSU game, but to start, let's just go broad. Just uh, your initial takeaways looking back at the game against ETSU from Saturday. Well, first of all, I told the guys, and I said this at the press conference, is, is that's probably the best Southern Conference team I've seen since the 14-15 Chattanooga teams. Those were two really good teams. Uh, I think that uh, they've done a good job of recruiting. They don't have a whole lot of transfers. They've got about five or six guys. They got one guy that's in his tenth year or sixth year, as old as Brady. Um, but other than that, for the most part, I think most of those guys are homegrown, recruited guys, which you, you know I think they've done a good job with. Uh, he's built the system, and schematically they fit. Schematically, he does a good job with it. And uh, defensively, they're fundamental. They don't do a whole lot to try to fool you. They come right at you. They got really good linebackers, and uh, they make you work for every yard. Somebody asked me earlier this week about my thoughts, and you're more qualified to answer it, but how do, how do they stack up? How do they compare to what you dealt with with Coastal Carolina earlier this year? Two different teams, and um, Coastal Carolina's probably overall team speed. Coastal Carolina's got 20-something um, fifth and sixth-year guys. You know, those guys are well-experienced. They're a top-15 team, and I, and I truly, believe, truly believe that they're probably higher than that. Uh, once they run through that league, they'll probably be somewhere in the top 12 to top 10 when this thing is all shaken out after watching the whole Sun Belt. So, you know, overall, I think they're uh, – Coastal Carolina is a lot more skilled than ETSU, but as far as big, physical, downhill for what ETSU does um, offensively and defensively, I, I, they're a good football team for this for FCS level. Yeah, yeah, they sure are. It was a one-possession game at the half. They're on the road with them. Uh, they pulled away in the second half. Was it a, a case of, you know, did you feel like your guys wore down a little bit or they wore you down as the game went on? 
two things happened is one we couldn't go score for score with them which was going to be important in that game uh, and then number two we did get worn down and their guys just leaned on us and this is what we always tell our guys we want to do we want to lean on them until the fourth quarter until we can bust it open so we got to stay close enough and unfortunately we couldn't stay close enough there uh, we couldn't keep it into that six point kind of where we were at halftime uh, moving forward there and we just we had to stay on the field a little bit more on offense to do that Let's talk about your defense early on, um, you know, that bend but not break approach. They had to defend the short field. They held them to the two field goal attempts early on. And then as the game went on, as we just kind of alluded to, ETSU started to score more points, especially in the second half. Overall, what did you think of your defense? Look, it's okay. You can say it. I went for it on fourth down in my own territory. We didn't get it. I gave the defense a short field. Uh, I understand it. It's uh, The great thing about it is the defense responded. They responded exactly the way that they, they should have. But uh, it was interesting. I'll tell you a little quick story about that that fourth down call right there, um, especially early on in the game. You know, we're going to go for those. We're going to take chances. Uh, as I always say, and I, and I even tell this to the special teams guy and the defensive coordinator is, um, especially with us, is the aggressive call is always really rewarded right it is you need to be aggressive you need to be aggressive with our offense with our team with everything you, you don't you can't let the kids think that you can't get this first down right here even though you may not get it right you down the line you're going to get that first down um so I'm standing there, and, and the line judge, he turns to me, he just kind of reaches, he whispers over, and he goes, Coach, you do know that's fourth down, right? <laughs> and I said, I, I know it's fourth down, don't worry about it. Uh, it was a fourth and two, it was a fourth and three. We didn't get it. Uh, defense steps up, though, that we, we force him into a field goal. It, I also felt really confident in the way that we were playing defensively. Uh, I also felt confident in the way our offense was playing. We have to show confidence in those guys to uh, to take chances with it and take chances against a good team. Uh, it didn't hurt us. We were able to maybe lost a little bit of field position there but you never know how that works um so we take the uh, we get the field goal attempt right there we're playing good on uh they miss it so no harm no foul essentially right there and uh, at that point you're feeling really good about it you're you're playing a, a good team and we actually had the lead in the first quarter uh on a really good team and then we had it to six points at the half yeah i yeah I, I like the call and you mentioned well, it there. You. yeah and, and i said we said it on the broadcast um and you mentioned it there but it, to make a decision like that does it require that confidence in your defense just in case you don't get it it does it, it, and it requires probably pre-thought too like no matter what i'm going for it here if it's uh, within this amount of range i'm going for it uh, i used to use a lot of analytics mm -hmm. we used analytics the last two years i didn't i'm not going with it this year uh, i felt one way or another, I, th I thought it was more of a gut feeling. I, I wanted to go for more of a gut feeling. What ended up happening to the play calling was you start gearing it towards whether you wanted to go for it on fourth down or not instead of just like this is what we're going for it. And, um, you know, going into a drive when you have the analytics, it's, it's all about the are you within that range? Are you going to punt the ball if it's fourth and three? Are you going to go for it if it's fourth and three? And uh, what are the percentages that the offense will go down and score mm -hmm. from that yard line, wherever you're at right there? And um, you're thinking about all those things instead of thinking about the next play call. And it, and it got to be really cluttered. So this year I went without it. Um, I don't notice the difference, to be honest with you. Some offenses may because they're not geared the way that we are. Uh, we should be able to get fourth and two, to be honest with you. You said you've gone without it. So have you completely ditched the analytics or just they don't play as large? No, we completely ditched it. Oh, wow. Completely ditched it. Uh, gone more with gut. Uh, I'm not, it, it's taught me a lot, though. Is I've kind of figured out where that was, and I figured mm -hmm. it out last uh, last spring where that threshold was. Right. Was um, okay, you know, uh, fourth and six in your own uh, in your own territory, somewhere around the 20, 25. That was always kind of like, okay, well, this is where you punt the ball. But you know, fourth and three, fourth and four, fourth and five. Sometimes you just go for it. Yeah. Um, and the guy up at Presbyterian, he just goes for it all the time, and he plays the extreme analytics. And I'm not really sure what it's getting him right now, but uh, to be honest with you is you could do that i mean they give you four downs as we say why don't you use it? it's not canada <laughs> yeah that's right speaking of, of four downs and, and using them uh skipping ahead on my notes um offensively three for 13 on third downs this week you guys were doing a good job the last couple weeks on third downs was that a case of uh, falling behind uh, the chains what led to the third down offensively well when i addressed the the, the team uh, on sunday and here were the things that we didn't do well and i kind of said it on uh, in the press conference on monday was uh penalties we hadn't had penalties like that in, in I don't even know if we've had them really all that year, all this whole year. It was, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of false start penalties. We had two or three false start penalties. We had two uh, really bad personal foul penalties. You know, and you get caught behind on those, and you're trying to catch up. Well, the other thing is, is when you're playing a game that's getting out of hand, 
close to the fourth quarter right there and you're just going for it. You're going for everything, right? You're going on third down. You're going on fourth down. You don't care what it is. You're throwing the ball. You're trying to make up ground. That's the other reason why you go three for 13 and then uh, I think we were two for four on fourth down. Yeah, excuse the numbers a little bit. Same with the passing game where, as we've talked the last couple of weeks, you've had the most efficient passing attack in the conference. This past Saturday there in the second half, I'm sure it becomes a little bit different when the defense knows you have to then throw the ball as opposed to an option attack that can sneak those passes in you know at times throughout the game yeah in the last drive before the half right there we had that thing set up for maybe a drive driving a half or so uh, we had it ready to go and uh, I came in on Sunday and I said you know what we had a minute 15 or so a minute 20 left on the clock uh, when we threw that ball from the 24 yard line maybe we should have just tried to chew it was a first and 10 call uh, maybe we should have just tried to you know chew some more clock there and get it down so that way we left the defense with less time however when you think about those things you're also thinking about man this is a juicy opportunity I'm in the red zone I've got an opportunity to get them you know off my tail for the second half a little bit get them uh, thinking more about the pass and you know it turns out Riley's you know scot free like we figured he would be Jalen Adams in his return to his hometown there. How'd you think your quarterback played? You know, average at times. I thought could have been better in certain scenarios. I thought that um, rushing wise, he did really well. I mean, he broke off a few runs. We had a couple of counters. We sat here and talked about counters. Uh, I had to sit on my comments a little bit because I knew we were going to run a lot more counters this week, uh, being last week the ETSU game. So I just I kind of sat on that a little bit. But uh, you know, yeah, we had a couple of counters designed for him. He gets really set up two or three scores with those counters. So played well with that. I thought he could have thrown it better. And, um, you know, we had Raleigh on a third down conversion, I thought. We had him wide open. We just needed to put a ball in there a little bit. A, a pass that he's made, you know, probably a dozen times in practice over the last four or five weeks. Yeah, those counters, they're almost like, you know, like bootlegs for him uh, getting out. And, and some big, uh, the first three times he ran them, they all went for 10-plus yards. What leads to the success? What makes that so tricky for a defense? You know, what led to the success with those plays Saturday? You know, you're always looking to control the backside a little bit. And we control the backside with our reverses, with our counters. And we were able to hit the reverse to Raleigh uh, in the red zone. We were able to hit a couple of the, t the toss counters. But uh, one thing that you, you got to realize is when you go, uh, fourth and two, and going back to that fourth down call, we called our toss play, right? And uh, the corner supported really hard. The um, the place that linebacker got out of the box a little bit on us. The safety gets out a little bit on us. All right, so now you're, you're looking, okay, well, how do I control those backside backers? Well, those are the ways that you contr control them, right? You fake the toss one way, uh, and we do we did two things uh, last week. We faked the toss, and we just ran um, – we ran a little counter tray play, an old Washington Redskins counter tray play, essentially out the backside. Uh, and then the other one is we ran a little bit of a toss option out the back. We fake it one way, and we've got a pitch out the back. Uh, two things that we knew would kind of work. Two things that we knew would kind of control the backside a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, I believe it was somewhere in the, maybe the late third quarter we went to the well one too many times, and they stuck back there. Well, at least you got the backside controlled, right? And you mentioned that touchdown pass uh, er, earlier a few moments ago to Riley Webb and Riley finding the end zone for the third straight game. It didn't come on the first possession this time, but still found the end zone with that touchdown. I know you touched on it, but take us through that play that led to the touchdown pass to Webb. Well, if you if you travel back and you travel back to the possession before that is we were stuck in our own end a little bit and it was a difficult situation back there. We were trying to uh, get the ball out from about the four or five yard line. We were stuck on the two and the three. We get the uh, we get about a yard or two on the first down, the second down. We try to pull it out and we try a little bit of our, uh, our midline option play and the corner just over supported all the way. And uh, at, so at that point, you kind of knew that you had to control the corner a little bit. So you got the corner and the safety biting down on your um, uh, on your run play. So that's a true setup for your triple option for your uh, play action pass. And when you can do that, uh, that's how you need to control those guys within our offense. It's not uh, me playing video games out there. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not just calling plays to call plays like, uh, you know, I'm a kid with a headset and a remote control in my hand. I'm calling them based upon a, a formula. I'm calling them based upon a, um, uh, a system. You know, it's a system of plays that we have to be able to control what we want to get controlled and uh, how do we do it. Well, that's the one way that we do. We control the secondary with play action pass. And... Um, we knew it. we had it. We sat on it a little bit. We had it two years before that, too. Uh, it's just something that you're going to have to constantly remind the defense to cover. Yeah, that is interesting because I have been nothing more than a kid playing, you know, with a controller in my hand. So as a play caller, how much of the process is trying to set up something a little bit down the road? 
you know, for it, 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 the, the offenses have changed so much. And when you go to, the, to so much of the up-tempo stuff, you're just running plays at that point, and you're just trying to catch people not lining up. Uh, you're trying to, and, and, and that's that's part of their system, right? And they're they're just trying to, um, you know, really outspeed you at that point. Well, uh, ETSU is another one. They're a very systematic team. They're going to attack you in certain ways. They're going to play action you in certain ways based upon the way that they see you support and based upon the way that they're um, – that you're playing certain gaps well we're no different than that is we need to see where we need to attack certain gaps where do we need to control backers where do we need to control secondary guys um, and then hey sometimes you just need to downright pound them a little bit and that's what we did in the first quarter we'll continue to talk about that game with ETSU and get ready for Furman this week another big game for the Bulldogs on the road against Furman a team they've beaten the last two years and we'll uh, start to prep for that one coming up a little bit later on it's the coaches show with the head coach of the Bulldogs coach Brent Thompson here from Big John's Tavern at 2 51 East Bay Street in downtown Charleston. We're here every Wednesday night. The Coaches Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits and more coming up with the head coach of the Bulldogs next after this on the Citadel Sports Network.
And talking about that game against ETSU this past weekend before we look ahead to the matchup with Furman coming up on Saturday on the road. A big one for the Bulldogs against Furman. But, Coach, going back to um, the game this past week against ETSU, a couple other things to, to touch on. First off, how about Matt Campbell setting a record with that 84-yard punt and really changed field position? What do you think of that kick? Well, you keep taking me back to this game, by the way, and really need to be going forward here. We got Furman this week, and we're looking forward to that game. But uh, uh, two things is, is one is uh, uh, their kicker, by the way, they punted one all the way down. The guy's been averaging about 30, 33, maybe 35 yards a punt. Um, goes out there against us and pins us all the way down to about the three-yard line with a rugby kick. Hadn't seen a rugby kick out of him all week or all year. And uh, so that one, you know, that one hurt. I, I was glad to see that Matt comes back and answers with a huge kick uh, on his own right there, which is huge. Is when you've got a weapon like him, if you remember, and I, and I said this over the headsets, I said it to Turner, our, our special teams coordinator. I said, well, that's a good thing because we, we got a 15-yard penalty. It's a good thing we got a 15-yard penalty. That would have been in the end zone right there. That's right. So we really gave him a little bit more space to, to kick it with. But um, outstanding kick. It was, it was really helpful for us. And um, just to have a weapon like that at our disposal, at any moment he can boom one pretty good. Yeah, he got a good bounce on that one. But just in general, I you know, how strong do you think that leg is? Like if he was just kicking in air and just kicking, just trying to rip it instead of focusing on placing it somewhere, do you have any sort of range how far you think he could actually punt the football? You know, on an average, Matt's about a 45 to 50 yarder. And, you know, depending, our place always has different wind swirling around a little bit. So it's a little bit different to, our, to kick at our place. But he's got an extremely strong leg. I didn't know that he could, you know, even still, I think he could put it about 60, 65 yards on the, on the fly and still get uh, a little bit of a bounce out of it. Uh, He's got great hang time. He's got, you know, great ability. His consistency would be the key for him, you know, and if he wanted a chance to kick in the NFL, that would be the number one thing for him. Let's look ahead to this Furman game coming up on Saturday as uh, we get ready to take on Furman here on the road. First, again, let's start uh, somewhat generally. Just a scouting report. What have you seen from this Furman team as you get ready for them Saturday? Interesting football team is they are um, they have remade themselves a little bit. They're playing um, a lot younger roster guys and their freshmen are starting to, to, to play a little bit they're starting a freshman quarterback they played him a little bit in the last two games and it's starting to uh, it's starting to pay off for him I think he's he's gone with a little bit of a younger roster even on defense there's about two or three depth chart changes that I've noticed over the last two weeks or so but uh, they've made a commitment to the run game Devin Wynn is a really they've got Devin Wynn they've probably got two more running backs that are about as good, maybe better than him at times, different than him at times. Uh, but Devin is a downhill physical runner, and that's what he showed. Uh, and that's what they wanted him to do. I mean, they went out with a purpose against Wofford to run him. I believe they ran him close to 30 times for over 200 yards. And um, he was a downhill threat and force, really. Yeah, they made that quarterback change this past week with Jace Wilson. Uh, only the one game so far against Wofford, but it's going off of what you do have that one game what have you seen from him as a quarterback it's interesting a lot of the most recent quarterbacks have been in the same kind of mold of each other um, going back Hamp, who is still on the roster Hamp Sisson who we recruited um, is a really good football player and he, he's a, a, a great starter and a great backup there and um, actually won the job from Granger who we also kind of recruited as well um, we had him on our radar for a little bit and then going all the way back to Blazajowski they're all in the same mold as their all you know wiry scrambling around kind of guys can hurt you with their feet uh, can scramble around and make some plays with their uh, with their arm a little bit um, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, what's the development of Jason you know going forward he's a, uh, a Texas kid throws the ball extremely well and obviously I told you he can move around quite a bit that's interesting that you mentioned about those quarterbacks that you guys had recruited. Maybe that helped in, in knowing them because the last two games, I even wrote down the numbers, Furman's passing attack against your defense in the last two matchups, a combined 11 for 47 in the two games, only 168 yards in the two games, just one passing touchdown to two interceptions. You tell me, maybe it was, you know, it helped with that familiarity, but, but what led to the last two meetings specifically, your defense doing such a great job against their passing attack? Well, you know, Tony's done a good job. As, uh, he's uh, found out pressure points, and he's applied pressure to the quarterback there, and he's forced those interceptions. And uh, I believe Jay Smith had the interception last year on him, which was just a complete forced ball at that point. Um, so, you know, 
he's the one that takes really should get all the credit for it. He's got the right matchups in place. Um, he knows where to attack the the protections and everything. So um, I, I've been really pleased with the way that we've played against him. But you know, of course, this is a whole new year, and I know from an offensive end of things, is if somebody has gotten that kind of a, uh, an advantage on me, I'm spending an awful lot of time looking at him. You know, I spent a lot of time looking at VMI. Right? I spent a lot of time looking at Wofford when um, you know when Coach Ayers was there. You know, it was, it was just. 12 or 13 years of just constantly losing to those guys, you're going to naturally spend a lot of time of where can I attack this defense. So, say Furman, you know, comes out with a few wrinkles as a coach, do, can you ever prepare for the, you know, like the unexpected or you just go off of things in the past which you've seen on tape and, you know, what you should expect? That's all you can go off of is there's, there's really two things that will bail you out. One is fundamentals and two is your rules. And anything new that you see offensively or defensively, you better have those two things in place. You better play fundamental football, something that you can go back to, and you better play your rules. All right, this guy's here. He's in this gap. I got to play this gap. All right. That's the way that you got to be able to line up and treat a lot of these teams. Going back to their quarterback again, just the one game that he played, he made his first start against Wofford on Saturday, only made one other appearance in a college game before that. Uh, how uh, much harder does that make it to prepare for that quarterback specifically? Like how large of a, of a sample size would you feel comfortable with to get ready truly, get ready for uh, the quarterback you're facing? You know, typically going off a whole offense, like if you've never seen an offensive coordinator, you need about three or four games, right? Um, the hard part is, is if you had a backup quarterback in there that was there, uh, and I'll give you an example of this, is uh, Sanford, right? Sanford with uh, Oladokun was there and he became the starter. Well, he's a complete Completely different quarterback than the guy that ended up beating him out, uh, Welch, right now, right? Completely different quarterback. So you got two different style of quarterbacks, which is two completely different offenses there. Um, even though they're the same offense, you know, uh, uh, Sanford had to kind of remake their offense around what they had. Well, Furman. Those quarterbacks are very similar. It's just a matter of uh, what is he capable of doing within his offense. And uh, the hard part is, is as the weeks go on, right, so they had a bye week, so they knew that they were going to start him in the bye week, right? They didn't just come up with that the week of the Wofford right. game, right? So they prepare him for the Wofford game. They prepare him for the, the Citadel game now. So now it's what is he added to his repertoire every single week until you get to about three or four weeks when he's got about the whole thing in. Same thing with Jalen, right? We kept it very, very simple for him. This is what he can do. This is where we need to be with him in the Spring. This is kind of like we need to give the ball to Devin Wynn. We need to give the ball to our fullback or A-back here. We need to make sure that we have ways of getting out of plays and it, that doesn't fit what he needs to do. You're talking with uh, Coach Thompson, the head coach of the Bulldogs, as we do every Wednesday, getting ready for the game against Furman on Saturday. Al alongside the quarterback, you mentioned the running back, Devin Wynn, with all the carries he got. You faced him before. What type of runner, for those that don't remember that aren't familiar, what type of runner is Devin Wynn? He's a downhill physical back, and, and you see it more as the year went on. Like he's The Wofford game was kind of the breakout. This was this is the style of football that he wants to play. He wants to get downhill. He's got good speed. He's got a little bit of shiftiness to him, but we saw him just hammer Wofford at times. Uh, for this game against uh, Furman, just in general, in fact, you know, you touched on earlier about the turnovers that were either forced against Furman the last couple of years by Tony's defense or even the last couple of games. For the, your defense this year, the turnovers have come in the wins. The, the turnovers have not been there in losses. Sometimes you have to ask a dumb question to get a good answer. So let me ask you a dumb question. You know, what, how important or how big of a difference do those turnovers make for your defense? Well... I explain it all the time to the to the staff when we come in on Sunday and we don't do those things right. There, there's there's two or three things that we got to do to win football games. One is first force turnovers because um, not only is it possession and possession time, but it's also field position. Is if you go back and you take a look at field position, Coastal Carolina field position, Charleston Southern field position last week against ETSU, you're asking an offense to be able to go 85, 90 yards, almost 97 yards one time, um, just to be able to get touchdowns and, and chew clock. And that, that's very hard for an offense to do over and over and over again. Now, can we do it? Yeah. Should we do it? Yeah. We need about. 10 play drives, 16 play drives to be able to do that uh, and execute perfectly all along the way. But, however, you're going to need some breaks. All right, whether you get a turnover, whether you 
get a fourth down, which you know that happened against VMI, right? Those are considered turnovers to us. Mm -hmm. Fourth downs that they don't convert on. Those are considered um, field goals, long field goals that they don't convert on. Those are huge things for us. So those, that's what we've got to be able to do and count on. Um, unfortunately, ETSU doesn't put the ball in danger. They're handing it to a running back that's got a pretty good offensive line in front of them. Let's face it, they're big guys. Uh, they know what they're doing in the zone game, number one. Number two is the running back's a fifth-year guy. He's, he's, he's run the ball plenty of times. He knows how to handle the ball. Uh, and then number three, they don't take, they don't put the quarterback in a bad situation really much at all. They know what they're getting. They're going to play action it. They're going to make sure that they know the exact look for the quarterback. And he throws it well enough to be able to complete those balls, and he's got good enough receivers. We'll continue to get ready for the game against Furman this weekend with the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson, when we come back here on the Coach's Show as we are located at Big John's Tavern, as we are every Wednesday during the season, talking Citadel football, 251 East Bay Street, place now owned and operated by three Citadel grads, so come out and see them. Big John's Tavern, 251 East Bay Street. We're here every Wednesday night. The Coach's Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits and more with the head coach coming up as we'll continue to get ready for the Furman Paladins and that matchup on Saturday. Right after this, here all across the Citadel Sports Network.
Head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson here from Big John's Tavern, located at 251 East Bay Street, where we are every Wednesday to talk Citadel football, the place now operated by three Citadel grads. It's up and running. Come out and see them here. 251 East Bay Street, Big John's Tavern. The Coach's Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits each and every week as we get ready for the Citadel and Furman this week. And, Coach, I know I've asked you about this in the past, but, you know, when you look at Citadel football and the different rivalries that exist, whether it's VMI, Furman, Wofford, everybody has a different answer. For you, how do you look at Furman, Wofford, VMI, stack those three up with one another? No, nah, we don't like them all, you know, and, and that's the way that you've got to approach it because there, there's there's just certain things, and I say this thing every single year, right? VMI, it, it, and that that's really become a really good rivalry, right? It, it's been competitive in the last few years. Finally got it back, and, and, and to their credit, I think they've done a really good job with it. Um, that one has really kind of come to the, the top for me, right? Not having the Shaco, I thought it was um, everywhere I went for two straight years, that's what I heard about, right? Not having the Shaco, we got to beat those guys. Um, and then when you go up to Greenville and you're always worried about those guys up there, right? I mean, we finally got a couple wins against those guys the last two years, which has been nice. But uh, that's the next thing, right? You, you got to beat, you got to beat Furman. And then for myself, uh, going back to when we first got here, we lost 12 straight or so, 14 straight to Wofford. Uh, you got to beat those guys, you know. And so all three of them are equally as important at times. They just have a little bit of a different weight with certain guys. Doesn't matter to me, you know. It's a, uh, it's a rivalry game. It's a, it's a hot, it's a contested game and it's one of those games that um, it, if it means a lot to uh, a huge portion of our fan base then it means a lot to me. I learned very quickly you can't wear any purple not only this week but just in general if you're involved at the Citadel when it comes to Furman. Did you have any purple in the wardrobe to begin with that you had to ditch? Well, I still have one purple shirt. I never, ever wear it. Um, I was at a golf tournament when I first got here with Coach Houston, and um, Coach Houston showed up to the golf tournament with a purple Puma shirt on. And it was so bad to the point where the alumni went into the golf shop and purchased him a shirt that he should wear instead of that purple shirt. So from then on, I understood where I was at and yeah. what I was not to wear. And now I've got probably 100 shades of blue in my closet. Well, in the last two years, your team has certainly had a lot of success against Furman. Uh, beat them 27-10 two years ago at their place, 26-7 just a few months ago here in Charleston. So add that up. The last two matchups, the Citadel has outscored Furman 53-17. to When you look back at those two games, what's been the difference? What has allowed your team to have that much success recently against Furman? Well, last, week, last year was a little bit of an anomaly. We had, um, it was a fairly average but nine offensive day against them we you know it was over 300 yards but we didn't throw for very much uh, but we had two really kind of really good special teams things that happened to us number one is we blocked a punt for a touchdown and then on the ensuing kickoff we um, kicked a, a sky kick up in there got caught up in the wind as I said the wind is brutal in, Char in uh, Johnson Hagen at times uh, it landed at their feet they didn't recover two plays later we go down and score so that's a 14 play 14 point differential right there so I think uh, that was last year's game. The game up there was in the driving rain, and uh, we came to play. It was one of those days we were just on. Some days you have those days. Defense played extremely well. Offense, we turned the ball over two or three times, um, but we were able to get bailed out by the defense. Yeah, you know, when you play like that, because it's never easy to go on the road and win, but as you said, you guys played really well. You dominated that game. You controlled that full game against Furman on the road in the, in the elements against them two years ago. When you have a win like that, now that you head back there for the first time since, you know, does that help with the just the confidence factor? Hey, last time we were here, we've beaten this team. We've won in the stadium before. Yeah, and, and a couple things I said to the, the kids going into this is, number one is um, it was homecoming the last time that we played here. So number one is they, they, they scheduled you for homecoming, right? That's how important that you are to them. So don't don't you think that they're going to take this game lightly as well. That's, that's number one. Um, and then the second thing I said to these guys was uh, they scheduled this game. Every other game, I don't think they've kicked off in the last two years from later than 2 o'clock. They scheduled this game at 6 o'clock for a reason. Uh, they're coming for you. You better be ready for it. we got to be prepared for it. And uh, there's a reason why they want to kick this this game in particular at six yeah we talked about that 430 kick for ETSU this is a six o'clock kick where you know you're hanging around waiting all day for kickoff on Saturday I know in the NFL certain players say they don't like the primetime games they, they're used to playing in the afternoon instead of waiting around so 
for your team, for your guys, what do you think about a 6 o'clock kick here on the road? What will that be like? You know, you know the 6 o'clock kick doesn't bother us at all. We played extremely well at home at 6 o'clock against North Greenville. Um, the time that you play really shouldn't matter. It does not matter. Um, it's, it's always the time, as we said, when you get home, right? Is It's the 2 o'clock get home time. And, uh, you know, the, you got to keep in mind that there is a return trip, right? These are all home and home games in the league. So uh, we'll be sure to repay the favor here soon. What's the health? That you're, we're about at the midway point here. What's the health of your team right now as uh, we get ready for this game? You know, about to be expected is we've got our, our fair share of injuries and, and guys that aren't able to play. Um, but you know what? So does everybody out You're five or six games into the end of the year. You're into the meat of your conference schedule. You're going to have those things. Uh, I don't worry about them. I, we just got to play with the next man up. That's the way it is. I know Ryan McCarthy was unavailable the last couple of games, so Carter Moody stepped in, had his first catch of the year on Saturday. Just what, what have you seen? What, what do you like from Carter just as a, a wide receiver with you guys? You know, Carter's been with us for four years. He's a walk-on guy for us. Uh, comes to work every single day. He's paying dividends. He's got one of the best hands on the team. Great concentration uh, and a really just a scrappy player. I love having him around. Getting ready for the Furman game Saturday with uh, Coach Thompson here as the Bulldogs will head up that way this weekend. 6 p.m. kick against Furman coming up this weekend for the Bulldogs and we in the meantime will take our final time out come back and uh, put the finishing touches on this one as we get ready for the Paladins and that 6 p.m. kickoff on Saturday again it's the coaches show here at Big, Big John's Tavern where we are located every Wednesday night 251 East Bay Street in downtown Charleston come check them out even when we're not here the coaches show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits each and every week we'll uh, put the finishing touches on our preparation for the Citadel Furman here tonight. Get ready for that game Saturday when we come back here in the Coaches Show right here on the Citadel Sports Network.
Coach Brent Thompson as we continue to look ahead to the game against Furman Saturday on the road here from our new location this year, Big John's Tavern for the Coaches Show all year long at 251 East Bay Street in downtown Charleston. And the Coaches Show brought to you, as always, by Cutwater Spirits. As we talk Citadel football every Wednesday night here from downtown Charleston and uh, getting ready for Furman this weekend. But before we get to the keys of that game and the final things regarding the Paladins, we always try to sneak in a couple of questions from online. And uh, somebody had asked about um, offensively, the Bulldogs, you, your offense runs a play every uh, 28 seconds. Um, <laughs> now, is it a general approach or does it vary game by game when it comes to pacing, the pacing you would like offensively? <laughs> it's funny. So every 28 seconds, okay, so um, we do have the ability to go faster. We do have the ability to kind of move a little quicker, and it's been something that I've been on the guys about is trying to move a little bit quicker. Um, but there are certain times in the game, so, you know, that average is going to be adjusted. Like in the VMI game, we're obviously killing clock. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to kill it late in the third, late in the fourth quarter. We're running team so that we can do that. Um, generally, I don't put necessarily a clock on it because uh, there is a thought there. Is those teams that are going so fast, like the Chip Kellys of the world out there that are going so fast, is it's just a different mentality. As I said, there's there's certain things that they are looking for, um, and one of them is just just flat out getting lined up out there, and you know, and everything's zone blocked with that. With us, it's a little bit different. Is we're looking for different schemes that we can run and how that they're aligning, uh, and giving our quarterback a little bit of a chance to kind of take a look at it so uh, on one hand it, it, we do want to move fast but on the other hand we don't want to do it at the detriment of our own offense so you know if we could be somewhere in the getting back to the, the question itself somewhere in between 20 to 28 seconds that should be about where we're at yeah you mentioned teams that move quickly i know samford and western carolina and we'll obviously talk about them when they, we reach those game weeks but they're two of the teams that that move the quickest uh just in general you know how much of a, a challenge is that for a defense when the offense does try like a chip kelly try to get lined up quickly it's forced us on offense to get better at it because we need to service our defense because the scout team can't service it you can try to run two cards and try to rapid fire it but the quality won't be as good so uh, we've done it the last ever since you know Charleston Southern game is we've upped our tempo. We run an actual five-minute tempo period Tuesdays and Wednesdays where it's a pre-scripted run on line of scrimmage. We run it offensively as a two-minute drill against them, get lined up, throw all different formations at them, throw the run game at them, throw the pass game at them. Uh, and, that, you know, that, that, that helps us out as well. It also helps them out. Uh, I think it's made our two-minute drill a little bit better as well. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, I'm not really a... a, a I'm more of a football purist when it comes to this kind of stuff. You are snapping the football. The chains aren't ready set. You know, the we, we've actually employed a whole other person in some regard to be able to spot the ball at the FBS level, right? There's the center judge now that kind of just has that role. In the XFL, they had a guy that's all he did was spot the football. So we can do that. And all we are doing is we're appeasing um, the fan base, right? We're appeasing this this excitement level of, uh, of football, right? Because it's become an offensive world. Uh, in my world, we don't live that way, right? In my world, power football. In my world, I'm a Wisconsin kind of guy, right? Uh, we want to be able to, and ETSU does it as well. They huddle up old school wise, they drill it down, and then all of a sudden they, they're back again and they're going to keep wearing you out. And as I tell my guys and I tell the guys is football, what you're exerting is the energy right there, right? So we are naturally exerting a lot of energy both on the offensive line and we're also applying that energy to the defensive line. Sanford and those guys, they're not, they're, you're not exerting as much energy when you're pass pro and you're pass rushing. It's not physical against physical. So what they're doing is they're trying to wear you out with just the sheer speed of it. Okay, So I'll give you a great example of this. So Sanford will go down and they'll run a deep ball. Okay, The guy will step off the sideline, another guy will come in right there. They're moving fast. right? They should you know that that's their pace the, the wide receiver comes off the ball there's another comes out and another guy comes in the game right there is they're trying to take advantage of a little bit of the system which hey, that's what we do as football coaches we're we're always trying to game the system in right. some way or another um it's just different styles different approaches i'm still a bit of an old school guy when it comes to that i'm a football purist um i want to you know if if i couldn't do what i did Offensively, I would do what ETSU does. All right, those guys, uh, they play a purely physical, hardcore downhill game. 
The other question was about trying to prepare for a passing attack as an option team in practice. I asked you about that a couple weeks ago. So you can go back on the YouTube channel, if you wish, and uh, find that from one of the last couple of weeks when we were here uh, for a coach's show previously as we look ahead to the Furman game coming up on Saturday. And this won't be the last question I ask you, but uh, let me get to it now. Keys to the game Saturday uh, as you get ready to take on Furman on the road. What are the most important things you, you want to make sure you focus on for Saturday? We've got to obviously stop the run on defense, and we have put an emphasis on that. We didn't do a great job with it yesterday, so we redid it again today. And we did it right today, and I thought we played extremely hard and extremely well on defense in practice today, uh, and that's going to be beneficial to us. I wasn't going to let yesterday be it for us. I wasn't going to let yesterday be the, the satisfaction of, okay, well, we'll get it figured out by Saturday. We had to get it right today, and uh, I thought we did. I thought the defense came out, and they, they really uh, did a great job of stopping the run today. Uh, number two is offensively, of course, we've got to be able to run the ball, run the fullback in there, um, adjust to whatever. You know, this is a defense that has thrown in the last two years, I, you know, probably a half a dozen different looks at you, which can be confusing. So you got to you got to prepare and you got to make sure that your kids are prepared uh, and you've got to have a real solid plan of how do you want to attack all those fronts and how you're going to handle and how you're going to deal with them. Uh, speaking of that running game, the A-backs got uh, quite, quite a few touches this past week against ETSU. Just from like a scouting report as the head coach, when you look at the A-backs and what they've done so far this year, you know, what are your impressions of, of that group so far this season? You know, they've been solid. Those guys, you ask them to do a lot of things. You, you ask them to catch the ball, you ask them to run the football, you also ask them to block for one another. Uh, and they've done a great job. They really have... Um, <laughs> anything that we've thrown at them. The, the good thing about this A-back class, uh, as opposed to where we were last fall and where we were last spring, is we've got experienced guys in there that have kind of lined up in different formations and they've gotten different motions. And we can do a lot of different stuff when our A-backs know what they're doing and know where they're going. And uh, Dom, who played quarterback here for us, um, has done a good job. He's coached him. I've, I've cut him loose to him. I think he's done a good job of getting those guys going in the right direction. But we also have Nikim, who's played four years here with us. We also have uh, Keontae who's played five years here with us. And we got Coop that played all last year here with us. So we've got three to four guys that really know what they're doing out there. A few uh, last things here before we have to run tonight as we get ready for Furman with the 6 o'clock kick Saturday on the road. Of course, coverage, if you can't make it to the game, you can always listen to it from anywhere in the world with coverage beginning at 5 p.m. on the radio network uh, Saturday. We talked about the 6 p.m. kickoff and what game day's like on the road. But, you know, with it being a 6 o'clock kickoff, not a far trip, what is Friday going to be like for, uh, for this particular road trip? You know, Friday we, we've always got to treat it very similar to the rest of our trips. We don't get out of routine too much. We don't do well out of routine. We're uh, a very rigid routine structured school and our guys stay within that. So um, for the most part we get up, we'll go eat our breakfast, we'll get ready to go. We'll have a special teams meeting uh, and then we'll do a offense defense positional meeting, review the film from Thursday uh, and then we'll typically have about a 45 to 50 minute walk through with special teams, offense, defense. We'll always cover certain scenarios, onside kicks, those kind of things. Just get everything out of the way on Friday. Then we'll uh, eat around 11 or and depart around 12. Going back to what happened to us last uh, last week, you know, it's a three and a half, four hour trip up there. Four and a half hour, you know, it could be a five hour trip up there, let's face it, uh, at any moment. So we want to leave here at about five o'clock. So that way we get up there, uh, give ourselves about an hour, hour and a half to decompress before 6, 6.30 dinner. Then what we'll do is um, we'll have a 7.30 um, offense defense meeting. Well, that'll go for about a, an hour to about 8.30. From about 8.30 to 9 o'clock, we'll meet as a team and talk about uh, what the schedule looks like for the next day, what we can expect out of the environment, what are the weather conditions going to be, how do we win this football game, uh, do we have to stop the run, who do we have to focus on as a team. It's the first time that we really get a chance to talk strategy as a team when we put all the pieces together from the week. Then... Um, We'll have a 9 o'clock snack, we'll go to bed, and then we'll have a 9.30 bed check or so, and at 10 o'clock, coaches will make one final round to make sure that we're all set and ready to go. Last thing before we let you go, as mentioned, you won here last time two years ago. I'm sure it's always great to win at home in front of a packed house. What is it like to get a road win, especially when their house is packed and you go in there and beat a team on the road? You know, it felt good to go up there and win. You know, th those, are, those are tough things, especially when you're going into a, a little bit of a... Uh, 
a hostile environment. But the one thing that's been great up there the last couple of years, we've bought our core cadets up there, which has been nice, uh, which will be the same this year. It, it, uh, it makes it a big game for us, makes it a little bit more of a home atmosphere for us uh, up there in Greenville. We always have a great showing up there. Uh, the visitor side is truly the visitor side. It's not like a home side with a visitor section in it. Uh, so with us, we have a, um, I, I'll say we'll have a pretty good contingency of Greenville folks there that'll come out and support us. Yeah, and we're certainly looking forward to it. It's always a fun time up there, a big game. The Bulldogs won there two years ago, have beaten firm in the last two matchups in general, and looking forward to the game Saturday, which kicks off at 6 p.m. Coverage will begin at 5 p.m across the radio network, which you can listen to anywhere in the world online. Just head to thecitycharleston.com, or if you are local, you can find it on 102.1 FM. 6 p.m. kickoff Saturday. Coverage begins at 5, and, of course, we'll be back here next Wednesday for the Coaches Show. Coach, appreciate it as always. Wish you the best of luck. My pleasure, man. I'll see you up there. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, and we'll be back here next Wednesday for the Coaches Show from Big John's Tavern right here on the Citadel Sports Network.